In 1580, the Society of Jesus, known as Jesuits, were the chief propagating force of the Catholic faith in India, China, Malaysia and Japan. After the Reformation, the Catholic Church began to turn its eyes outward of Europe to proselytize along Portuguese and Spanish trading routes. Even though Martin Luther's Reformation managed to topple the Catholic Church's monopoly on Christianity, it was still a giant apparatus of wealth, power and moral guidance in Europe. However, how exactly this wealth is distributed among church institutions is often determined by the opinion of high-ranking clergy of the individual caste centers. The Jesuit order was just one of many, and the Asian propagation theater competed with those in Africa and the New World. To influence the opinion of the Roman Curia, missionaries would write letters and reports entailing the attractiveness of the region they were proselytizing in. More so than letters, dignitaries from foreign countries visiting in person and telling tales of their countries from a native's perspective were considered to have a much higher effectiveness of increasing opinion and subsequently financing with Rome. In Japan, the Jesuit order faced difficulties from the beginning of their propagation efforts. The perception of religion which the Japanese harbored was incomparable to the European thought. Traditions, customs and manners placed importance on different activities and lifestyles. All in all, propagation of the Christian faith in Japan was considered by many contemporaries to not be an easy feat. Chief Jesuit missionary Alessandro Valignano, who took the reins in 1579, sought to increase the number of conversions by encouraging missionaries to show cultural tolerance, apply a liberal interpretation of the catechism, and even to try to accept the light syncretism with local beliefs. Valignano was almost incredibly progressive for the time, and his pragmatism surrounding propagation led to conversion numbers skyrocketing in the 20 years since he took over. However, even with decent conversion numbers, the Sword of Democles was hanging above all missionary theaters as one stroke of a pen from the Pope or the Jesuit superior general could end missionary activities entirely. Valignano's goal in 1580 was the radical expansion of propagation efforts in Japan. Even though he was responsible for India and China as well, Valignano would write that Japan is a special place and propagation in Japan was his proper vocation. This sentiment was certainly not limited to Valignano. Many Jesuit missionaries residing in Japan would write in the highest regards to the culture and character of the Japanese people, while others encouraged the adoption of Portuguese or European customs for Japanese converts. Valignano thought it critical for the Japanese culture to be preserved and merely injected with Christianity. The sentiment among Jesuits of the time was that among the Asian countries a full conversion to Christianity was most likely to occur in Japan. Valignano wanted the Jesuit order, as well as the Pontifex, to sanction and most importantly finance a radical expansion of missionary activities in Japan. Japan, however, was of course almost on the other side of the world. While it was common since the early 1540s for Portuguese traders to arrive in Japan, only one Japanese person has visited Europe so far. Bernardo of Kagoshima was one of the first Japanese Christians. He was baptized by Francisco Xavier, the first Jesuit missionary in Japan in 1549, 30 years before Valignano took charge. He traveled to Europe in 1553 and was probably instrumental in convincing the Pope of the viability of propagation in his homeland. Since then, however, no Japanese person has visited the continent and the only picture that was painted of Japan's Christianity was based on letters. Valignano knew, in order to convince the European Catholic world to finance his plans, he needed to show them something in person. He construed a plan for an embassy of young Japanese Christian boys to a tour throughout Catholic Europe. The embassy would consist of representatives of the Christian daimyos of Western Japan, who would, just like European ambassadors, request a papal audience to pay obeisance to the Supreme Bishop. The four boys were Martin Yohara, Juliao Nakaura, Miguel Chichiwa and Mancho Ito, the latter being the spokesperson. They are reported to have been under 15 years of age, 
and educated in Christian catechism and Portuguese. Valignano wanted to accompany the embassy to Europe, but was required to stay in India and thus gave command to Father Nuno Rodriguez. The embassy had three main goals, as stated by Valignano himself. First, the embassy should secure approval from the Pope for Valignano's propagation ambitions in Japan. Second, the embassy should convince kings and high clergy of the dignity of the Japanese and prove that the high praise the country received in the letters sent by the Jesuits, which were circled around Europe and found of great interest, was not an exaggeration but justified. The third goal was different. Valignano wanted the four boys to experience Catholicism and all its power, wealth and status in Europe, so that they would spread the word upon their return to Japanese daimyo and samurai. While the first two goals were directed at influencing Europeans, the third goal was directed at Japan. The perception of the Japanese, of Jesuits or Christians for that matter, was somewhat mixed. The Jesuits were a mendicant order and thus did not project much wealth, at least in the beginning, which is why their tales of the wealth and power the Catholic Church possessed in Europe were often met with skepticism. The religion in Japan at the time, Shinto Buddhism, was not in any way as powerful as the Catholic Church in Europe. When someone wanted to become king or emperor in Europe, in most cases they would have to come to the Pope and ask first, at least until the Reformation. The Pope, as a religious leader and kingmaker, was certainly the most powerful person in late medieval Europe. This concept of a religious figure being more powerful than a king is unheard of in Japan, where Buddhist schools or Shinto shrines may have had some level of local influence, but were never considered kingmakers. To corroborate the tales of missionaries, Valignano wanted the boys to see the Catholic Church in all its glory in Europe and return to Japan to spread the word among the elite. They departed Japan in 1582, and when the embassy arrived in Lisbon in 1584, they were treated in a manner befitting most important foreign dignitaries. They were received by a cardinal and archbishop in Portugal, and continued their journey towards Rome, in Spain. There they were received by the archbishop, and later by King Philip II, again in a most respectful manner, befitting high-ranking foreign princes or diplomats. When they arrived in Italy, a papal honor guard escorted them until Rome. Contemporary accounts emphasize the high level of honor this entailed. However, historians argue that during the time of the early 1580s, banditry and lawlessness was prevalent in Italy and the Papal States after the sacking of Rome in 1527, so the Pope likely ordered the guard in order to ensure the safety of the embassy. Valignano urged in letters that the embassy should be treated with respect and be received in a manner at least moderately festive. Pope Gregory XIII, however, took it one step further and received the embassy in March of 1585 in the Sala Regia with an entourage of cardinals, archbishops and lay dignitaries in a most pompous manner. The Pope was a patron of Jesuit propagation activity overseas and wanted to project the power and authority of the Catholic Church to the embassy as much as possible. In reality, of course, heresy was prevalent in Europe and the church was in a precarious situation. At this day, however, the problems would not matter, as the four boys were received by the Pope in a most festive manner. The boys were described as of tender age, noble, who from remote and distant kingdoms had come from afar to make their submission to the Roman Church and prostrate themselves to venerate the Vicar of Jesus Christ on earth. The significance of this moment for the Church is perhaps best understood when referring to contemporary accounts who state that the Pope and many bystanders were moved to tears by the sight of these noble boys. During this time of strife in Europe against heresy and pagan idolatry overseas, the sight of noble and faithful Catholics from a distant kingdom, mostly unknown to many present, must have certainly been an uplifting experience for a Catholic clergyman. A Jesuit missionary who was part of the embassy conducted a speech after the obeisance ceremony in which he praised the Japanese as exceeding other peoples of the Orient in natural abilities and skills of war. He even went so far to exclaim that in comparison with Europeans, the only thing the Japanese lacked was Christian belief. During this time when European cultural and racial supremacy was prevalent, such a statement is evident of the high level of regard sought to express. After retelling the missionary activities of the past 30 years, the mission missionary sought financial assistance for new seminarios and churches in Japan, which the Pope approved. Only one month after the audience, on April 10th, however, Pope Gregory XIII would pass away. The embassy was still in Rome and attended the funeral of the Pope 
as well as the enthronement mass of the new Pope, Sixtus V. The boys were active participants, carrying the papal days and presenting the holy water for the Pope to wash his hands. On April 27th, Pope Sixtus V, also keenly interested in Japan like his predecessor, received the boys in an audience and granted expensive gifts. The Roman Senate also made the boys citizens and patricians of Rome, a highly regarded honor which Mancio would describe with the flattering words, formerly Rome had conquered the world by force, now with the holy faith its radiance extended even to Japan. The embassy left Rome in June and toured the Italian states, arriving in Venice, Verona, Mantua, Milan and Genoa. Everywhere they went, they were welcomed with the same pomp and ceremony as in Rome. Word has spread about the noble Christians from a kingdom on the other side of the world and European courts were extending invitations to the embassy en masse. Many articles in newspapers circulated through Europe and scholars at the time, both in Catholic and Protestant countries, took note of the four noble boys. France, Savoy and the Holy Roman Empire extended invitations but were turned down. Even though audiences at the aforementioned courts would have no doubt added to the already considerable propaganda victories, there were two main reasons why the embassy declined. As stated earlier, Valignano wanted to project an image as much on the boys as on the Europeans. The idea of absolute power of the Catholic Church was among those, and traveling to regions like Germany, where Protestantism was rampant, would have no doubt led to an exposure to heresy. The one thing Valignano definitely did not want to arrive in Japan. Also, the goal of the boys returning to Japan and reporting what they witnessed was almost equally as important as the court audiences. The embassy returned to Portugal and left Europe in April of 1586, reuniting with Valignano and after a dangerous journey at sea, arrived in Japan in 1590, more than eight years after their departure. They found their country vastly different as to when they departed, as now, Toyotomi Hideyoshi has finally united Japan and rose to become Shogun. Valignano immediately put the boys, who now turn into men, to use and asked for an audience with Hideyoshi as ambassador of the Pope. Hideyoshi was suspicious of Christianity and viewed it as a destabilizing factor, something for which he had no patience. He decreed in 1587 that all foreign missionaries were to be expelled from Japan. Valignano wanted the boys to convince Hideyoshi to retract this decree. The ceremony was just like in Rome, received with great interest, with the only difference being that the Pope was battered by revolts and problems, whereas Hideyoshi was at the height of his power, with Japan at his feet and his eyes turning towards Korea and China. After multiple exchanges, Hideyoshi decided to not enforce the decree and instead urged missionaries to stay discreet in their activities. He wrote a strongly worded letter to Valignano in which he argued eloquently that as Christianity was central in Europe, Japan was the land of the gods, referring to Kami and Buddha, and that the government and social order of the Japanese people depended upon these gods. For that reason, Christianity is a threat which he chose to ban. In the end, the embassy could not change the fate of Japan, as Tokugawa Ieyasu, who took the shogunate after Toyotomi Hideyoshi's death, continued the oppression of Christianity, finally banning the religion entirely in 1614, ending all missionary efforts by the Jesuits and other Christian orders for the next 250 years. The four boys chose to join the Jesuit order and were ordained as the first Japanese Jesuit fathers. Pancho Ito died in 1612 as an ordained Jesuit priest after studying in Macau. Martinho preached in Nagasaki and was banished to Macau in 1614, along with many other Christian daimyos and missionaries. Juliao evaded the ban and continued preaching in secret, finally being caught by the shogunate in 1632 and dying in martyrdom shortly after. Miguel had a different path as he left the Jesuit order and served daimyo Omura Yoshiaki, who apostatized in 1606 and Miguel allegedly left the faith as well. In 2017, however, what is believed to be a rosary was found in the grave of Miguel, suggesting that he had apostatized only superficially, as had many at the time, and continued his faith in secret. This journey was only a small part in the 500-year-long history of Christianity in Japan. If you want to learn more about the history of Christianity in Japan, check out my video. Have a nice day!